Now, last week we began this series we're calling Reformation. And I said to you last week that you have been formed by life and you need to be reformed by the gospel. And this morning I want to dive into that phrase and those principles even a little bit further, especially the idea that you have been formed by life. And so as we begin this morning, I need you to um, engage your imagination with me, all right? I want you to do sort of an imaginative thought experiment with me as a means of preparing ourselves to understand what Scripture is going to say to us. And so I want you to imagine that we are sort of alien anthropologists that have been sent to investigate 21st century North America. We're coming into this culture and this time from the outside. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you a description uh, of, a, of a popular religious venue in our city. I'm going to ask you to sort of see this place with new eyes this morning. And so uh, I'm actually going to read from a book written by someone who's more thoughtful at this than I am. But as I read, I, I want you to sort of enter into this with me and imagine us uh, walking up to this place in our city and imagine what we would see and encounter there. As we approach from a distance, we notice the sheer popularity of the site, as indicated by the colorful sea of parking that surrounds the building. The site is throbbing with pilgrims every day of the week. We begin to wind our way toward a building that sprawls in both directions and seems to be rising from the horizon, a dazzling array of glass and concrete. The architecture of the building has a recognizable code that makes us feel at home in any city. The large glass atriums at the entrances are framed by banners and flags, Familiar texts and symbols on the exterior walls help us quickly and easily identify what's inside. As we enter the space, we are ushered into a narthex of sorts intended for receiving, orienting, and channeling new seekers. There's a large map, a kind of worship aid to provide direction into the labyrinth. The design of the interior is inviting to an almost excessive degree, sucking us into the enclosed interior spaces with windows on the ceiling, but none on the walls. This conveys a sense of vertical and transcendent openness that at the same time shuts off the clamor and distractions of the horizontal mundane world. This architectural mode of enclosure and enfolding offers a feeling of sanctuary, retreat, and escape. As we wander the labyrinth in contemplation, preparing to enter one of the chapels, we'll be struck by the rich iconography that lines the walls and interior spaces. These statues and icons seem to embody concrete images of the good life. While other religions are promising salvation through the thin, dry media of books and messages, this new global religion is offering embodied pictures of the redeemed that invite us to Imagine ourselves in their shoes. This is a gospel whose power is beauty, which speaks to our deepest desires. As we pause to reflect on some of the icons on the outside of one of the chapels, we are invited to enter, to taste and see. We are greeted by a welcoming acolyte who offers to shepherd us through the experience but also has the wisdom to allow us to explore on our own terms. After time spent focused and searching, we proceed to the altar, which is the consummation of worship. Behind the altar is a priest who presides over the consummating transaction. We don't leave this transformative experience with just good feelings or pious generalities, but rather with something concrete and tangible. And so we make our sacrifice, we leave our donation, released by the priest with a benediction, we make our way out of the chapel. Perhaps some of you have figured out by now that the religious site that I'm describing is your local shopping mall. But describing the mall as a religious site is not merely a metaphor or an analogy. The mall is a religious and formative institution. 
I, I borrow that thought exercise, that analogy from James K.A. Smith, who wrote a very insightful book a couple years ago called Desiring the Kingdom. And I wanted to begin this morning with that exercise to, to drive home a very simple reality, and the reality is this. You are being formed. The only question is, by what? Rene Descartes, who lived from 1596 to 1650, is one of the most influential philosophers in Western history. Descartes' famous phrase was, I think, therefore I am. For Descartes, being was thinking. He launched the philosophical movement we call rationalism, the idea that truth and knowledge come to us primarily through the mind. Most of us are rationalists, whether we ever intended to be or not, whether we've ever thought about it or not. We think that we are formed primarily by information. We're under the illusion that nothing shapes us unless we choose to allow it to through the filter of our minds. And because we are rationalists, we're blind to the subtle influences that form us every day of our lives. We're blind to the fact that a trip to the mall is a formative experience. In 2007, which was the most recent year I could find statistics for, U.S. companies spent $279 billion on advertising. When's the last time you saw an ad that tried to win you over through rational propositional logic? Why are companies willing to spend almost $300 billion in order to create in you an impression? The obvious answer is because it works. You are being formed. The only question is, by what? You see, Descartes was wrong. You are not primarily a thinking being. You are primarily a desiring being. The most important thing about you is not what you think, but rather what you love. And that's exactly what God is teaching us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And so if you have a Bible this morning, I want you to go there. And I want us to dwell on and think about these verses. Let me read them again to you. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions is not from the Father but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Notice what this passage is saying. You are formed by what you love. John says, if you want to be a person who loves God, you're going to have to choose not to love the world. And by contrast, if you love the world, it's not possible for you to love God. You are either being formed by the love of the world, the desires of the world, or you are being formed by the love of the Father, the will of the Father, the kingdom of the Father. You are being formed. The only question is, by what? This text in 1 John gives us some profound insight into the dynamics of formation and reformation. So let's consider it carefully. How does the love of the world take root in us? How does it get formed? Look at what John says in verse 16. All that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes, 
and pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. The word desires in this passage is the Greek word epithumia. It literally means over desires, cravings, longings. One wise counselor put it this way, when your wants become needs, that's epithumia. When I would like to have that becomes I must have that, that's epithumia. All the desires you have are fundamentally good. right? They're, they're placed in you because you are made in the image of God by a loving creator. Sin does not create in you any new desires. Rather, what sin does is to twist and deform the desires that God placed in you so that they become over-desires, inordinate desires, controlling desires. The great writer Charles Dickens understood this well. So well, in fact, that he gave us a literary portrait of what it looks like when desire begins to master a person, when I want becomes I must have. Listen carefully from one of Dickens' most loved stories. Ebenezer Scrooge was older now. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye which showed the passion that had taken root. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a morning dress, in whose eyes there were tears which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. Another idol has displaced me, she said softly. A golden one. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you. What then, he retorted, I am not changed towards you. She shook her head. You are changed. When our contract was made, you were another man. What happened to Ebenezer Scrooge? He developed an inordinate desire for wealth, for gain. And that desire shaped him into a different kind of man. You are being formed. The only question is, by what? John says the primary thing that causes you to love the world is desires. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, pride in possessions. And so he counsels you, do not love the world or the things in the world. The question 1 John 2 demands you to ask is this. What do you love? What do you want? What do you desire? Deep down in the core of your being, what is it that you really deeply long for? That's a frightening question. And a really, really helpful one. What do you really really want. I asked myself this question a few years ago. Got to a place where in confronting the bad fruit that I was seeing in my life, uh, by God's grace and through scripture was trying to work my way back to what's, what's the root of that? What, what is that coming from? What do I really want? 
that manifests itself in these outward behaviors? The answer for me was respect. I wanted to be respected. I wanted to be honored by whoever was around, my wife, my children, my colleagues, my friends. I craved respect. And so when you gave me that, it's a fairly nice person to be around, but if you disrespected me, the fruit you would see in my life would be anger, frustration, discouragement, despair, brooding. See, the desire for respect is not in itself bad. But when you must be respected, when you expect to be respected, when you crave respect, that's epithumia. That's over-desire. That's become a false God that has eclipsed and replaced the true God in your affections and in your loves. That's me. What about you? What is it that you desire? What I love about this particular passage written by the Apostle John, is that it doesn't just leave us there. It just doesn't just leave us asking the question, what do we really want? It also takes us further. Right? What do I do now? What if I do desire, love, crave, want, need something other than God? What do I do about that? How do I put those worldly desires to death and bring to life a love, a desire for God? Look at verse 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires. See, John is hinting here at the answer to the question we just asked. What do I do when I begin to see over-desires, ungodly desires, worldly desires? He says, well, the first thing you need is you need an eternal anchor. You need a hope. You need a love. You need an object of desire that is not fleeting and temporary and destined to go away. Because that's the problem with the world and with every worldly desire. It can't possibly fulfill what you're asking of it because it's fleeting and it's temporary and it's not going to last. You need a love, a hope a refuge for the soul that is eternal and lasting. And that is the Lord Jesus himself. He is the eternal God-man, the, the one that your soul was designed to rest in and find hope in and be anchored and rooted in. St. Augustine, when he preached on this passage, put it this way, Jesus became temporal so that you might partake of eternity. The first thing you need to reorder and reorient the desires of your heart is you need a lasting, a better, a surer, a more eternal hope and love. That's who Jesus is. That's what Jesus came to bring. So, so John hints at that reality. Look, the world's passing away. You need a hope, you need a love, you need an object of desire that's not passing away. But second, you also need a plan for reforming your desires. You need a, a new object of desire, and you need the reformation, the reorienting of the desires you have. You need a plan for beginning to desire differently, changing what you want. And look at the insight John gives us to that, verse 17, the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Did you catch the subtle switch there? Right, all along, John's been using the language of love, of desire, these deep core internal motivations. And now all of a sudden, he just switched to behavior language. Did you catch that? 
The man who does the will of God, the person who does the will of God, abides forever. Why the switch? Why did we start talking about love and desires and now we're talking about the one who does the will of God? The reason is actually quite simple. Because the Bible never separates the two. Jesus says, the one who has my commandments and keeps them, that's the person who loves me. James says, faith without works, without obedience, is dead faith. Jesus, as we looked at last week, says, a good tree bears good fruit. The Bible's not going to let you separate loving God and obeying God, which we love to do, right? What we want to say is, I love God, I just have a hard time obeying him. The Bible wants to hold that up and say, "Uh uh-uh. No, 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 let's back up. Love and obedience, desire and behavior go together. If you love God, you increasingly want to do his will and see the fruit of doing his will produced in your life. If you have no desire to do his will, it just reveals that you don't love him. But the insight here goes even deeper than that. Here's what this verse is saying. Doing the will of God forms you in the love of God. Doing the will of God forms you in the love of God. We like to think that the flow only goes in the other direction, right? I love God, therefore I do his will. And and that is true, right? True obedience comes from a heart that has been renovated, changed, brought alive by grace. But the flow goes the other way as well. For those of us who've been brought to life by the grace of God, who've been regenerated, the flow goes the other way as well. Doing the will of God strengthens my heart in the love of God. Remember, You are being formed. The only question is, by what are you being formed? If you want to become a godly person who loves God, who desires God, who treasures God, then you need to be formed by disciplines that help you become that kind of a person. You need to do the will of God so that you might be formed in the love of God. So John says, look, As you confront false desires, inordinate desires, ungodly, idolatrous desires in your heart, you need two things. You need a sure and eternal, a lasting hope. And you need to begin to do the will of God that you might be formed more deeply in the love of God. And so let me close by helping you to rethink the idea of spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are practices, Bible study, prayer, worship, and so on, that help to form certain patterns in your life. Most of you have gone out into the rural areas, you've gone hunting, or you've gone to your grandma's farm or something like that, and and you know what a farm road is, right? A farm road is a road that's not actually a road, it's just wheel ruts through a field, Right? And what's happened is vehicles have driven there and it's formed a road. Right? Now it's not a road that, you know, it's not a highway, but, but it's an access point. It's a, it's a way to get from A to B. And it's been formed by vehicles driving through that over time. Those vehicles have formed tracks or ruts. That's exactly what spiritual disciplines do in your heart. The idea behind disciplines is to form patterns, to to lay down some tracks, to to mow through the underbrush and get a clear path established in your heart. Do you know why many of you fail at spiritual disciplines? Because you think they're about information. You're still approaching them like a rationalist. For instance, you read the Bible or think you should read the Bible primarily to gain information. You wonder why you should pray because, look, if God is sovereign, doesn't he already know all the information I would give him in prayer anyway, so what good does it do? 
And you're fine rolling in late on Sunday mornings because after all, if you miss the call to worship or you miss the first few songs, at least you'll be here for the important part, the giving of information, the sermon. But listen, Scripture and prayer and Sunday worship are not primarily about information. They're primarily about formation. And if you start approaching them that way, it changes everything. Why do you read your Bible? Not just to gather data, but to become the kind of person who is rooted in and shaped by God's story. And who understands and knows his truth. Why do you pray? Not just to download your list of concerns to God, but to become the kind of person who is conversant with the Holy Spirit, who communes with and regularly experiences conversation with God. Why do you gather here on Sundays? Not just to take away some new information, but rather to form your soul in the cadence and the rhythm of worship so that you might learn what it means to live a life of worship. See, doing the will of God forms you in the love of God. Disciplines are not an end in themselves. You don't just do them because they're good things to do. They are a means to the end of Becoming the kind of person who loves the Father more than you love the world. You cannot and will not become that kind of a person apart from the reformation of your heart through the consistent practice of spiritual disciplines. You don't do them just because they're good to do. They're a means to the end of loving God. That's the goal. That's what it's about. That's what you're after. You are being formed. The only question is by what? Are you being formed by the world? Or are you being formed by the truth of God, the word of God, the spirit of God? The Apostle John urges you to ask this morning, what do you love? What over-desires, what inordinate desires, what controlling desires in you need to be put to death through the atoning work of Jesus on the cross and the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? And in what ways do you need to do the will of God so that you might be reformed in the love of God? If you're here this morning and and you've experienced the grace of God in the gospel, you've been regenerated, you've been brought from death to life by the grace of God, then then listen to me. You love God. You do. You you don't need to figure out how to love God. God has implanted a love for for him in you. Right? So listen to me. You love God Here's the problem. You live in a world that is always after your love. It's always after your desire. It's always pulling on, not your mind, but your heart, your cravings, your longing. It's trying to awaken discontentment and desire in you. If you're not aware of that, and you don't fight that with the bringing to life of deeper, fuller, more robust love for God, the love that you have for God, you'll consistently feel defeated in because your desires will always be pulled on by the world. The reason you need reformation is because you need to become the kind of person that increasingly is desiring, loving, wanting more of God and God's kingdom and God's truth and God's word and God's will in a way that allows you to live differently within the world. 
Instead of always having to defend yourself against the desires of the world, you desire something different while being immersed in the world. You begin playing offense instead of defense. That's how the grace of God, through the Spirit of God and the Word of God, intends to reform you. As you sit here this morning, you are being formed. The only question is, by what? Let's pray. We acknowledge, God, that we desire all kinds of things. Those of us who have been changed by you, we do truly and honestly desire you. And yet there are all kinds of competing desires and longings that we have. And so I want to pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just turn on the searchlight in our hearts, and that you begin to shine the light on what it is that we really deeply want, that we crave, that we long for, other than you. Now, would you give us the insight to see that and the honesty to be truthful about it, the humility to say it and to recognize it and to reckon with it? Spirit of God, would you begin to awaken in us not just an awareness of our wrong desires, our false desires, but would you begin to help us see disciplines differently? Would you help us see that you and your grace have given us your word? and your spirit, and your body, the people around us, to help to reform us into people who love you more deeply. I pray that even as we engage the next 10 minutes of this worship gathering, as we sing and as we come and receive communion, that we would do that not because it's what we do, but that we would do it recognizing that you intend through that to reform and awaken and bring to life good and godly desires within us. Would you help us thoughtfully, formatively engage with what you want to do in us this morning as we walk forward in life with you. For your glory, amen.